guys. Cool. So Rio, thank you so much for having us on the farm today. You know, the property is so beautiful and you know, as everybody can see, you know, you're on a, on a mountaintop with 360 degree views. Um, what a great place to make a farm. Yeah. And yet when you got here, it was not in good shape, you know, old forested property with lots of heavy machinery and yet you breathed life into it. So, so let's start there. Um, what is it that you did to help, uh, restore and regenerate the soil on the property? Yeah. The areas that we were farming had been gone, had been logged and, uh, had been degraded by big machinery, like you said. So they were hard packed. Um, so the soil was really like dried out when you kind of run when you run machine over and destroy all the biology in an area and then uh, it becomes hard the soil um, pores just close down it doesn't absorb water and so how to bring that uh, that from that state back into a biological state I mean you really need to sink carbon and you really need to sink biology back into the dirt so first is we designated our ag zones and we started digging trenches not deep trenches but like um two three feet in some areas some areas where it was much more stable deeper and we started burying our forestry products or our forestry thinnings from wildfire protection back into that those degraded areas and then we would layer the hard pack with compost with forest thinnings with wood chips, with any kind of biological, with any kind of like plant material. Anything you could yeah. find, right. Um, and develop these lasagna layers, which now are like, you know, quite deep and spongy and absorb water and really like uh, are wonderful for growing. Um, I like the idea that, you know, obviously there's wildfire issue here, but um, it just seems rather intuitive to be able to use all of the the, the forest stuff and the tree fall and all this stuff, put it to good use, rebuilding the soil in the same bioregion, um, which also then increases the safety of the farm itself and, and your neighbors, honestly. I mean, in permaculture, it's stacking functions. And so I wouldn't, I wasn't even thinking this way years ago. And, you know, I would import or buy soil from the trucks and plastic bags and they'd have to be shipped in and harvested from peat moss bogs yeah. where it's like totally not sustainable practices. And the more I learn, the more I realize that all the resources I need to grow amazing products and cannabis on my farm are already here. It's like biological diversity in a forest with the IMOs, you know, indigenous microorganisms, with the ramial chips, with the different um, ushnia hanging from the oak leaves, the herbs, the fungus, the grasses, it's all already existing and that diversity is the strength of a system a biological system so just kind of mimicking my 72 acres in my garden areas and trying to mimic the um, productivity of a forest system is what i'm trying to do now I, I love the fact too that you didn't bring in all of the soil products you know we talk a lot on shaping fire about uh, bioregionalism of, of microorganisms, right? So you might have a microbe from Alaska that's used to an entirely different environment, and so it does great in Alaska, but it doesn't do great here, right? Totally. But by um, by wildcrafting your inputs here on your property, you're really just moving the microbes around on your property, and so um, they're they're used to thriving in in your environment, and so you don't have to like move all this biology here have it crash yeah. and then rebuild it you're you're skipping you know that die off step by using mm -hmm. all of your own forested stuff for i mean for instance like we do the forest thing and then we wood chip and we collect those wood chips and we line all our paths with the wood chips and uh and then over winter the microorganisms that were already in this area are growing in our paths and so when we brew a tea now we just go on our paths and we dig up the white molds and the, and the microorganisms in those paths and just add it to the tea. Um, and yeah, it's, uh, it changes the smell of the tea. It really like, it adds a lot of uh, strength to the systems that are already in place. What a great thing to be able to do. I mean, like I make, I brew tea too, but you know, I'm, I'm using 
this person or that person's blend, right? Which I purchased, yeah. which, you know, since, you know, I live on Vashon Island, but, you know, I live really close to Seattle. So it's kind of rural city, right? But you're very much out here. And so you're being able to target the specific microbes you want just by producing them on the island and then using the brewing of the tea to essentially super concentrate them mm -hmm. and then feed them back to themselves. I love that. I don't know. I'm not a scientist, but I, just by experience, it's working really well. Well, from the plants that I hear, <laughs> I mean, we're early in the season here, but the plants that I saw were already jumping ahead. That, you know, nobody was uh, looked like they were shocked at all from being transplanted. Everybody's like, mm -hmm. you know, up and going appropriately for this time of year. Um, one of the things that I found interesting was, you know, I'll tour some farms and they'll use, you know, some wood chip mulch or or they, they might have a hugel or more. Um, but you have deployed um, wood and parts of tree like everywhere. It is clearly the the number one input that I've experienced from mm -hmm. touring today. And um, uh, I would think that that has to do with two, for two reasons. Number one, you live in a forest and so it's a resource you've got a lot of. But also you talk a lot about preserving water here. Mm -hmm. And and so you really seem to be using that wood for its 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 sponge capabilities. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Because water is clearly so dire here. Yeah. I mean, just like I was saying, it's uh, can the earth absorb rain? And where does it go once it's absorbed? And how um, what trees are thriving and uh, where is the runoff going? And, so getting ground cover on on every area that I can, it's like a, it's it starts microbiology going so quick. I mean, any place that I put wood chips, worms show up within a month or two, and they're like I put wood chips on the fruit trees, and they they're thriving and they're retaining water, and it it just holds it. So building swales. And then laying wood chips in the swale, and then um, and even and then wood chipping, just any in any area that um, is open, is is going to change the biology of the soil. The soil starts opening up because of the life that it brings. And there's different wood chips. Like the hardier wood from the tree is going to take a lot longer to 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 break down, versus the ramiel chips from the leaves and the branches is almost you know available much quicker. Is so, Ramiel a tree species? No, it's just the smaller branches. So it's the fingers, the, the outer edges of the, the new growth. Right on. And yeah. it's more biologically active and ready. It's, you know, it's softer wood. That's why people, I guess, use the green parts when they're going to make a fermentation or something, right? Because totally. it's more biologically active. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And we try to bury all, all types of stuff into our hoogles. Um, just, then we have stuff that's breaking down a little slower. And a lot of people are worried about the nitrogen, um, like pulling nitrogen out of your plants. But there's so, if you get the biology right and you get uh, living soils active, it's breaking down and producing at the same time. So I don't see that that's an issue. Yeah, I think that's a key to the making the jump from I'm adding nutrients to feed my plant versus us being soil farmers, right? And yeah. we're actually trying to you know, keep a healthy rhizosphere. And so long as we keep the soil healthy, the plant will be fine, right? It's I mean, a trust. <laughs> right? It's like, yeah, right? it is You're a trust. You're not used to it. You're used to pouring nutrients on it because it needs nitrogen. And I'm used to, I, that's how I grew up. It's like, this plant needs nitrogen, but that's because we were buying soil that everything was spent. Right. And then there was no worms in your bag soil. There was no, you know, you could open up the, the soil here and there's so many bugs and different things happening that are, from what I've learned from Elaine Ingram and the Dragonfly Earth Medicine cohorts is that it's just pulling nutrient. You need something to pull it out. It's like a, um, I guess there's different, different metaphors for it, but like the supermarket, like, um, you know, there's all these products in the supermarket, but until you have a living system, the doors are shut you open the doors and then all of a sudden you're like whoa those are already in there and with your you know we've walked this property for a while today and just like the 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 insects that we're hearing right now as you move in different height of your property and then you're more ag land versus you're more hard packed like 
um, you know, housing areas and where you keep your equipment, we're actually running into different sounds. It's a melody of different types of beetles and crickets and yeah. whatever you have up here. Um, you know, that kind of diversity, you want to model that in the soil just as much, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they're just different systems. Like the hoogles down below had much more forest products in them than the stuff up. Has, this has more annual and more. We just work this more at, from our compost, from our house and stuff like that. Um, but there are microclimates. It's like warmer on that side. We're kind of like in Benbo, there's a river on the north of us and a river on the southwest of us. So we're this island farm kind of if you if you're driving on the freeway you see just the mountain that we're on and we're literally the whole top of the this this island so we kind of have these crazy swirling wind patterns and a lot of different things going on um one of the things that we had talked about earlier was um you know the need to to slow down the water that's passing by because you know for a lot of folks who are who are lower down the mountain um, there are there are there are, there are there are springs and there's rainfall and one way or another the water comes down the mountain, yeah. and and different people can use it. But um, you know, not only are you at the top of the mountain, but um, regulations in California have changed a lot now, mm -hmm. so that so that most people can't use naturally occurring springs on their property or just above their property. And for you, there is no just above your property, right? So. Um, so if you would explain a little bit about how you are trying to sink the water here mm -hmm. uh, instead of letting any of it kind of move on past you. Yeah, I mean, that's a challenge. Like this is an ideal, like if you're studying land that's productive, the top of the mountain would not be the spot you would want because usually silt would run off the mountain and gather in the valleys and most ag lands in the valleys. and water starts pouring out of the side of the hill, but we're at the top of the hill. Luckily, we have 72 acres and we have a whole northern watershed area to it for our domestic use, but cannabis regulations make us store everything um, and only use rain catchment. So we've developed a series of three ponds where all of our greenhouses um, flow, the, the roof catchment from our greenhouses and our sheds and, and my father's house all flow into those and then we siphon off that into our reservoir. Um, so we do have uh, like 700,000 gallons in, in rain catchment. Um, but more than that is even on this space, and this is about six acres of top of the hill, and it, which, it, which has hills and flows, um, there's so many things we can do to, to store, to sink, to divert, to capture water on this six acres as much as possible. And we haven't really done as much as we can. There's still roads and we still do get runoff, but um, we're much better than we were. So let's talk about a couple of those strategies, right? Because I think that um, uh, not only do a lot of different kinds of farmers um, have to be creative when it comes to uh, creating and preserving water on their property, but also, you know, as as everybody starts to get drier, water's has become more valuable. Um, what are the couple of the strategies that you've used on the property to to sink the water and to keep it here? Um, mm -hmm. And I'll and I'll get you started. The one that I thought that was especially cool was uh, as we were walking down the road. You're like, oh, we're gonna we're gonna put catchment to spread the natural road rot off to the side. So mm -hmm. why don't you start there and then just kind of tell us anything else that, that, that along those lines. Yeah, like road is a perfect example of something that is um, that creates a runoff. Like you wouldn't find a road in a forest. And so all the water that falls around a tree is, like I said, the pores in a, in a, in a forest, all the mulch is there, the wood chips are there, the grass, and all those soil pores are open. Whereas a road, we're driving on it, we've killed all the biology, um, they're steep in parts, and so the water just runs downhill. And so Department of Fish and Wildlife and all the regulations have forced us farmers to really limit road, uh, road runoff, and which has been an amazing thing. I mean, I mean that's good. That, it's a, a very yeah, good thing. positive regulation, I mean, yeah. the politics are a little damaging on the other side, but right. the regulations I totally agree on. And so we've created swales in all of our roads. Every 
you know, 40 to 60 feet. So all the road runoff will stop, cross the road and ditch into the forest. And so the, our whole road system all the way down to the bottom last summer, we created these swale systems. So um, there's no more like really intense road, road ditching. Um, it's per made much less work for me in that, uh, the, you know, accounting for that, where every ounce of that water is gonna go with those swale systems really does stop road erosion. And the forest around there is now capturing wherever that pitches off into the forest, that's gonna capture that. Other than that, it's uh, like I was saying, like just watch it in the, ra in the rainstorms, see where the water is and see where there's little zones where maybe you can make a water retention. It's not like building ponds, but building water retention zones um, where you're not, you're not trying to store a lot of water, but you're using your land as the storage. So if you just create a little, uh, a little like a swale that looks like a horseshoe and then water just sits there for a day or two and then sinks in, you've created a whole bunch more water retention for everything under that zone or even around that zone. You, um, you seem to really, I mean, uh, your dad lives here, right? And so he's got this gorgeous garden, right? Bursting with color. And also, um, you know, you're really into polyculture, right? So you've got, you've got plants alongside and inside your beds. Um, you've got all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, herbal medicine, botanicals, you know, just like, you know, lining your beds, lining the road, just kind of everywhere. It would seem to me that uh, all these additional plantings, um, you know, just act as a big sponge and create this freeway down for the for the water that you hold it. Um, tell me a little bit about like the amount of effort it was for you to add all this polyculture because you know anybody who's probably following this channel realizes that we're all like you know you know pro polyculture and growing cannabis all on its own monocultures is is, is just like not really all that positive. But a lot of people think that they can't do it because it's like it takes so much effort just to grow the cannabis mm. that I don't have enough time to do to do all of these other plantings. And yet you've got them everywhere. So so so, you know, how much labor did that add to your season to be able to, um, you know, add this crop variety, but also water sinks? Yeah, I mean, I can't I couldn't do it alone. So having a team is very important. Sure. And a team that knows like I'm not fully, I'm not an herbalist or I'm, I don't know all the plant varieties. Um, so we have a team and we talk about it. We sit around the fire and we say, Hey, what if we did this? What if we did that? That's important. But I think that what I've learned is timing is everything. So as soon as I cut my cannabis, I'm throwing out cover crop. And then if I cover, uh, you know, in the early spring, I'm throwing wildflower seed. I love, that's like my favorite job is to literally just have a bucket and go out at the right time, judging on what weather, and just throw seed. So I just try to throw seed everywhere. Um, and then I do, I have a nursery where I propagate, um, you, you know, plants and plugging them in here and there on the edges. And um, it's fun. It's not really extra labor in that it, uh, um, but I mean, it's a learning curve. So I've definitely killed a lot of plants by putting them at the wrong time. I think timing is the biggest learning curve on that is, yeah. One of the things I thought was cool, so the when you're referring to this nursery, you're talking about the one made out of all of reclaimed materials, right? Yeah. So I thought that was pretty cool too, because, um, you know, I, I, I can see this theme kind of running throughout your life. You're all like, all right, how diverse, how can I bring diversity as a solution to each of these challenges that I've got? And how can I expand the productivity of my land um, trying to keep my, my resource footprint small and using what's here, right? And so when we saw your nursery, I mean, it was cool to go in and to see all the healthy plants rocking along. And then you're like, oh, yeah, this was from somewhere else. This was from somewhere else. And, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, you know, did you find that it was challenging to source the secondhand material and so it actually made it more laborious or did you find that actually when you shift your expectations to reclaiming stuff 
that it just kind of is everywhere. Yeah, I mean the latter. The for latter, sure. Yeah. It's like uh, I mean there's resources everywhere and adjusting your design to fit your resources is part of that plan. Like you might want a fully framed metal greenhouse. Um, but this has actually worked much better. We have reclaimed glass from I think a guy in Eureka had a whole pile of glass. I still have like 50 sheets of it. Uh -huh. um, so we made glass windows out of that. And all the redwood was from an old barn and over in West Haven, um, you know, by the coast. And um, it was just rotting in the ground. So we picked that up for a huge, like almost a whole barn for like three grand. Um, so we have this huge stack of old growth redwood. We just keep using it. We're still using it like four years later. I like that idea you've got of, of not forcing the solution to necessarily be, the, not forcing the solution to the problem mm -hmm. or to the challenge to be the one that you expect it to be, but instead kind of hold space with the challenge totally. and then look around you for, for what your natural environment might suggest as a solution. Um, I could learn from that myself. I mean, we all could, right? It's like permaculture or it's life. It's like if you if you uh, are attentive to what's in front of you and you're in the moment, then ideas just flow. And, uh, you know, I'd like to be well planned, but like gardening, it's like you have to, the best gardening tool is farmer's shadow. So just showing up up here and being here, these designs come. Like I have, I've always wanted to have like a full scale permaculture plan for my whole land. And then I do that and then we start jiving and talking and we end up doing something different. Yeah. And uh, I think it's been much more creative doing it the latter way. I think both are important because then the planning process brings in more thoughtful solutions and you can go back to that. So, but forcing stuff hasn't ever worked. Well, me. one thing I've learned from talking to permaculture people too is that your permaculture plan i mean unless you're doing it for a client right yeah, yeah. but really a permaculture plan is never finished because as soon as you're done you're like oh all right this is perfect and then you learn some more stuff and you're like all right and you, exactly. now you're changing things exactly. and so i think that's why people enjoy living like you're living is because it's a it's an active exercise in artistry with nature right it's like constantly oh, yeah. evolving and changing and as soon as you make your map you're going to be changing your map probably yeah 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 it's ever changing i mean you know you get out here and you get inspired um where my dad is a carpenter so he just ends up building little sheds all over he built this little like um collective kitchen for the workers on a trailer or uh lizzie his his girlfriend she's just like a wild gardener so she sees a place that needs a rose or a plant and she'll just stick a rose in the forest somewhere or you know, it's like, uh, you know, you, I, I, I mean, part of it, you have to like be productive and stay in business, which is, I guess that's my job. Right. And everybody else just kind of, you know, everyone else in the family has much more like creative freedom to like think that way. I think so, that interplay though, that, that really just brings home the importance of family based heritage cannabis farms everywhere, but specifically here in the Emerald Triangle, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a uh, you know the 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 ornamental and food gardens and the you know adds to the polyculture and the fact that you've got family here helps keep you feel alive and passionate right the um the ecosystem of people who are up here working on it is very unlike what i see in some of the valleys when they are setting up um you know kind of corporate cannabis monocultures mm -hmm. which can be interesting in their own right but usually it's because people are explaining some kind of new to new cool technology or yeah. or mechanism right and like that can be cool but but honestly you know dirt on the boots is a pretty great mechanism and just having all your family here is good too and it's culture like yeah. the homesteaders moved out to this land before there was cannabis here and there was a back to the land movement that was anti-corporate uh anti-war anti-industrial like and the beauty that that life created for me when I was a child um, of just like having this collective vision of hundreds and hundreds of people um, that wanted to live organically and, and free and having, you know, less, less 
less rules and I mean that created so much beauty that um, that's kind of what we're trying to fight for in the whole craft cannabis movement is like yeah cannabis is important but when you, who you smoke it with and where you're smoking and the truth that it brings out that's much more important yeah um so one of the things i love when i when i get to tour um cannabis property farms is that so every now and then i'll come across something that i've never seen before and it gets me really excited and i saw, saw such a thing today i so i saw your crater garden right uh-huh. and i'm going to be talking about this for weeks probably and you know if i understand it correctly essentially um you you dug out an area uh, in order to create windbreaks for it, and you took all the stones that you've been finding on your property and have been making terraces of them. And the idea is that um, uh, the sun beats on them all day. They are absorbing the the warmth, which extends the length of your day. Is that was that your idea when you built it? Yeah, and it just creates a really hot microclimate. So if you can protect the wind in a horseshoe pattern, and then the rocks act as like a moisture. It pulls moisture in when, or when it's hot, it pulls moisture up. And when it's cold, it kind of keeps moisture in. We actually mulch some of the grapes and some of the hotter weather plants with rock. Um, and this little zone is in a very like warmer part of our property so some of the sativas that are more equatorial are gonna go there and we're gonna see if they thrive like you know we are we're kind of in this banana belt of Humboldt up at 1700 feet and so we don't get the fog in the winter so the fog will roll in right below our property and it's and in that crater garden it's still gonna be hot in October November well, all right. So first, side note, it must be gorgeous when the clouds are below you and you're up here. I would like to see that sometime. But but also, um, did you, you know, how did the Crater Garden come about? Did you have these, these you know, these equatorial and Afghan, uh, not uh, African sativas that you wanted to give them their best chance? And so you built the Crater Garden for them? Or did you hear about a Crater Garden? You're like, I will make that and then I'll mm-hmm. find something to plant in it. I mean, I think it came about how we were talking about before, like some of my workers, I like just don't tell them what to do sometimes that are here. And one of one of my workers just like started building a crater garden and uh, I liked it. So I said, oh, man, this is perfect. This I identified what it was. And then he actually ended up not finishing it. So Lizzie came in and she started developing it um, and it really just grew organically like we were talking about, like it's been a community effort. And just before you came here, it really got together with tying it into the other garden. And so we like, we're like, oh my God, this is like, this crater garden is gonna be perfect for sativas. So we started built, we built some wood sheds and put our tanks like right above it to act as a windbreak. And we're gonna plant some more hedgerows of perennials and trees above it. So it will be this. So the idea just kind of, developed from being up here but, um oh good i'm oh, sorry um sep holzer is one of my gurus of permaculture and he wrote a book where he was growing bananas in the at like five thousand feet in austria wow. and so he found a black rock on his property um right in a zone that didn't get any wind and so he would plant banana trees right in that little zone and i think he built the little greenhouse in the snow to like make it last through the winter but in the summer he was pulling bananas out of 5,000 feet in Austria Jeez, pretty amazing so so in that same vein of like you know a, a rare crop in a rare place you've built this gorgeous crater garden that looks cool it it handles moisture well and it's going to be warmer for longer in the day what are you planning there this year like 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 that's a special place yeah. now right it's almost like an altar in a lot of ways what are you what are you what are you going to grow there because it's a, it's a smallish area i think we're going to grow this strain uh which is uh, lady africa um, which is a sheshimani cross with cherry pie with uh um, forbidden fruit which is tangy cherry pie and so we're going to put some of that and the sweet pink um, is a sativa that i also source from a friend um and that probably is going to go there too i did used to have columbia gold and Acapulco gold and I have some rare seeds 
um, but I didn't start those because I, I had the idea hadn't come to fruition. But so any of our more dominant sativas, and then we do have wine grapes and eating grapes. Um, I don't know. I, just dawned on me that this is a greater garden that now you're gonna have to <laughs> and now you're gonna have to plant it too yeah. so um the 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 the, the strain you mentioned was lady um lady africa and the name of your farm is lady sativa mm -hmm. and so am i correct to suggest that you made this cross here yourself you, i mean just like bob dylan like does anybody have complete authority over what they make so Yes, I have friends that brought me seeds and I crossed um, some of those. One of my friends crossed the Lady Africa or the Sheshimani with cherry pie, and then I crossed it with forbidden fruit once I learned the genetic background of that one. Where I'm going with this is, is the fact that, that particular cultivars, um, the bioregionalism of them is really important, right? Yeah. And you know, even though you are bringing land races in from Africa via friends, once once it once it got here you started doing large scale sifts on your own property in your own soil to see which which chemovars were going to love where you live right exactly. and then you chose phenos to plant this year based on on your local area and um and i think that, that that's probably going to become increasingly popular right as as most of the industry moves to commoditize cannabis where you know, you've got one hip strain that happens to be, you know, mentioned in a magazine and then everybody wants that. It's like, yeah. okay, you know, for the, for, for, a, for a general buying public that might be legitimate, but for people like you that are like very seriously craft, I think that, um, you know, the things that you're growing on your farm that tastes unique because mm -hmm. it's been grown in your soil is going to become more prevalent. And I'm guessing that you agree with that because we saw your 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 seeded light depth, right? Yeah. And so you're producing your own seeds. Um, would you tell us a little bit about the importance for you for producing your own seed um, and and why it's important to do it on your own property? I mean, the whole process is so exciting. Um, is to plant your whole land and then go out and find the plant that's thriving the most. Find the smells find and then you have your male garden and you're pulling the ones that aren't what you want and checking the structure and smelling the turps and then thinking going home and like waking up at two in the morning going oh my god i, should I do figured it out yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so i breed like the old school way where i just have a male garden on another part of my property and then i go and i select out the plants that I love most and that are doing the best in my on my land and then cross those with each other and so it's just the constant selection of like what's 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 doing and and I make enough crosses I mean I mean I make so many I'll probably do 50 different seed types per year or even more and then uh and then mark them and then go back and taste the flower and smell it as it's getting harvested and like have mental notes of which one was the right one and then next year I go oh I'm gonna do that one it's really uh, a really a joy to go through a greenhouse during a sift when the plants are allowed to grow taller because like sometimes uh, if yeah. you're gonna do a huge sift they need to stay small and, and and you can't really see their full adult expression I know but these light depth seeded plants are you know are coming up to our shoulders now and to see, you know, a whole line of them that came from the same folks, and yet, you know, this one's got this, you know, deep purple, but it's only underneath the leaves, and they're all they're all expressing themselves in different ways. Um, you know, for those of us who really love the plant, mm -hmm. um, that's really cool to see. So, so, so that we can all kind of share in in your joy on this or or nerdiness, however we want to look <laughs> at it. What are a couple? Where are some of the crosses? Like, just give us like you know two or three that you are most excited about this year. Yeah, the um, the one we're talking about is the Pure Kush Lime Pop from Mean Gene and Mendocino, right on. Um, which I grew. I've grown a few times, and it's just all an amazing plant. Um, cross with Fruit Loops from Huckleberry Hill Farms up here in Humboldt. So I'm taking my favorite from one region, crossing it with my favorite from this region, and the two together hasn't been done yet. So 
that that I'm super excited about that one. Um, what are some of the other ones? Uh, the that Lady Africa Forbidden Fruit. Uh, I feel like that one's really going to come together. Um, I did do a CBD cross last year or the year before, which I call Lady Benbow, and that's a uh, um, lion's quibbit, which is uh, Gone Genetics. Uh, he's out of Palm Springs, but it's like a Spanish variety of CBD cross with uh, another mean gene strain, which was Pina. Oh, um, yeah, I've had the Pina now. And that, that lion's quibbit has like this mercine deep purple, and the Pina is much more fruity. And you smelled that today, and that that's been a really fun strain because it does so good around here. It never gets mold. It's just like uh, it likes this dry climate, but it uh, it with the humble climate, it's like the buds are stacked hard and like full of resin, and it's a CBD plant. Um, but I have so many crosses that I didn't plant this year. <laughs> I don't even know, you know. One of the things that I found interesting is as we went through the different gardens, um, you had a lot of crosses with names that I was not familiar with. And, you know, it's not like I go deep into the history yeah. of crosses. You know, I usually interview people who are far more expert than that. But, but, but what you kept on saying is like, oh, I got this from this farm, or I got this from this farm, or this is, this is, oh, this is his reserve seed, right? Yeah. And um, it kind of gave me a look inside of uh, the farmer to farmer trading of seeds. Yeah. And and certainly there are seed swaps, right? Yeah. But, but what I was kind of picking up from you was way more informal and, and like way more family to family almost. Um, what can you say about the importance of cannabis farmers within a bioregion trading seeds outside of commerce? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the whole history of our of our community here is like we're uh, anti commercial uh, even some of the best. I mean, most of the best things that I've received have come through that channel. Like I have the uh, Green Lantern this year. So I'm planting 70 plants of Green Lantern. I didn't pay for those seeds. I mean, they're probably worth, you know, hundreds and hundreds of dollars on the market. You can't even get those seeds. But the person that, um, and that was the Emerald Cup winner from Ridgeline, who got it from the same guy that I got it from. But he just, like, my worker is one of his best friends, and that's how they tra we trade. And it's the same thing within this community. It's like, I don't need to buy anything from anybody really because i get uh inspiring conversations and i get food i get uh i mean yes we have a commerce but I'm, i just think that the craft movement is going to be defined by the community that holds it tight and talks and comes to the meetings and really builds this non-commerce uh, network so the best things i get are from say that for sure well thank you for inviting me up to come and check out your community and and meet some of your people and meet your ladies that are growing and i really appreciate both uh you opening yourselves up and and also the teaching that you shared with me so thank you very much Rio. i really appreciate thank meeting you, you. Right, All right on. thank you Thanks.